Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another edition of Infinite Loops. And I cannot tell you today we might actually achieve infinite loops. <laughs> I am so delighted to have as my guests Rick Doblin and Amy Emerson, who are respectively the founder and the CEO of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or as I call it, maps welcome thank you jim yeah now now actually though amy is uh, executive director of the maps public benefit corporation ah the, C okay. the ceo of the maps public yeah. benefit corporation <laughs> 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 yeah uh, we're the we're a wholly owned subsidiary of maps the nonprofit. that is very clever let's actually dive right in because this is a subject that fascinates me. We were talking before we started to record about uh, Natalie Ginsburg, who was kind of my uh, agent provocateur in this. Uh, she was a classmate with my daughter, Kate, at Yale, um, and obviously very, very bright woman and started uh, getting me interested. Uh, because I'll tell you frankly, I was a typical 60, or I wasn't in my 60s then, but I was a typical 55-year-old white guy who, you know, had kind of bought um, Nixon's uh, uh, vilification of uh, psychedelics. Um, didn't really think about it, didn't do them, uh, but didn't think about it one way or the other until Natalie and I started talking. And I read Michael's book, which I think are, is phenomenal and uh, then was introduced to, to MAPS. Uh, so um, let's start with uh, you, Rick, if that's okay. Your career fascinates me because for, for a while you were running essentially a uh, construction company, uh, owned and operated uh, Braxis Construction, 1975 yeah. to 1982. And yeah. then you decided, ah, what the hell? I'm gonna to go to Harvard, I'm gonna get my PhD uh, in psychedelics and I'm, I'm gonna go that way. What was there, was there, is there a wonderful origin story or did yeah. you just want, to, I'd love yeah. to hear it. Yeah, well, uh, sorry, my, my parents, um, that's my origin story here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, um, my parents, um, when I was 12, they had a house designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. Mm. So I grew up in Winnetka in, in uh, Chicago in this incredible house that was very inspirational to me personally. Um, I also, like you, originally believed a lot of the propaganda against LSD. And I thought that uh, if you took it six or seven times, you were certifiably insane. You know, that each, each time moved you a little bit closer to that. And then six or seven times you were over the edge and no hope for that. I also believed that it hurt your chromosomes and all of this. 
So I, I was pretty much scared of psychedelics um, during my high school years, during the 60s. I started college in 71. And I went to an experimental college called New College in Sarasota, Florida. It's now the Honors College of the state of Florida. Um, and that's where I started um, doing LSD. Um, but bef because I'd read this incredible book that was fantastic and I loved it. And I gave it to a friend of mine who had loaned it to me. And he said, this book was written partially under the influence of LSD. And, mm -hmm. and I said, that's impossible. Nothing good comes from LSD. It's hallucinations, it's delusions. It was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Wow. King. And it was written partially while he was under the influence of LSD. And so that's what sort of cracked the uh, propaganda shell for me. And I started looking deeper, but I'd been, the real origin story is that I'd been um, secondarily traumatized by the Holocaust, a lot of uh, distant relatives killed and just the human cruelty just really shocked me. And it, 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 I felt like I was um, multi-generations of uh, refugees from Russia and Poland, escaping anti-Semitism, coming to the United States, but in this, you know, the American dream. And, and so I felt though that I was trained by my parents to um, think about my job as sort of uh, protecting the Jewish people and, and myself and looking at sort of psychological mechanisms, how people can dehumanize others, can commit atrocities and think they're doing good things. Then compounded by the Cuban Missile Crisis and you know, now it's the whole world. And then um, later my confrontation with what to do about Vietnam. So all of this just made me realize that, you know, we were born, we're born into uh, humans that have not really fully evolved yet. And that we are destroying each other and destroying the environment, destroying species. And, and so that's what started me thinking inner, um, inner healing. And then also that was the same time as people going to the moon. And you know, and having this spiritual experience, looking back at the earth from the moon and realizing we're all together. And so when I first started taking psychedelics, I had this idea of the beyond ego states, how we're all connected. And I thought this is the antidote to genocide. If we can feel how we're all connected and not just hear it, but feel it, then we can have less fear for people that are different than us. And that we could see how much we're similar you know, if we look at our genetic material, we're very similar to a lot of animals <laughs> um, and humans even more, more so, just slight variations. And so it was for political reasons in 1972 that I decided to focus on my life on psychedelics. And then the construction business comes in because I had the delusion that uh, the more psychedelics you take, the faster you evolve. And I thought I can do that. I'll take more. <laughs> I'll take more and more. And I was not emotionally mature. I would get stuck. I would get scared. And, you know, it was really finally, I tried everything that I could imagine. Primal therapy, which was the primal scream. I did um, encounter groups in the, for a month in the um, mountains of California. I did LSD multiple times with different sitters. And I finally realized that I wasn't where I wanted to be. But I didn't know what to do because I'd done everything ex as strong as I could do. To kind of, and this was after the 60s had crashed and burned. And it was clear that it was massive resistance, but also mistakes made by some of the advocates. And we had to do this purification of ourselves. So I finally realized that um, I had skipped over this whole part about integration, that it's not just going out, it's what you bring back. And that if you keep going out and avoid the work of you know, bringing things back and changing your baseline, you're actually going backwards instead of forwards. And then I finally got this idea, I should build stuff. Maybe that'll be a way for me to get grounded. And that led to this 10 years of building. So I was already committed to being psychedelic therapist and working to bring psychedelics back before that whole construction career began, but I wasn't capable. I wasn't emotionally prepared. And so once I finally got through this construction process in 82, 10 years after I had dropped out of college, that's where I went back to school. And that's where I discovered, uh, I went out to Esalen to work with Stan and Christina Groff. And that's where I learned about MDMA in 82. And I learned about MDMA before the backlash, but the backlash was inevitable because it was also being sold as ecstasy. 
in public settings. And so that's how I started getting politically involved. Fascinating. Uh, Amy, did you come up more, uh, I, I hesitate to say traditional lines, but looking at your bio, you, you would work for several uh, big pharma companies. What, what was the moment when you were like, no, I've got to go, I've got to go do this? Because I know that you started on a pro bono basis back in 03. Am I right about that? Yes, for six years. <laughs> um, Maps didn't have a lot of money then. We still don't, but <laughs> even less then. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would say I would come up through this in a more traditional way. But, you know, I grew up on an island in Alaska on Kodiak Island, always in nature and around a lot of animals and being able to really explore. And um, my way into science was kind of through the creativity of it and the problem solving and the wanting to understand uh, how things worked. And I, I think that was a lot of me being able to kind of run around in the woods and ride horses and be out in the na in nature a lot. And so um, science like was just my thing from probably the time I was in third grade. And, um, and when I went to when I went, even in high school, I was very interested in genetics and cell biology and molecular biology was kind of this newer thing coming up. And that was what I decided to study in college. And um, so I did that. And I ended up working for actually a pretty small biotech that was doing um, pretty innovative work in cell selection technologies. And I decided I really didn't like being in the lab. Like I had this romantic idea of a scientist in the lab discovering things, but really you're proving yourself wrong like 90% of the time. And so I was like, I wanna go into clinical research where at least I'm working on something that's made it past that point and I need to be around more people. So um, I made my way into clinical research and then ultimately like vaccine research, uh, which is at the time then I met Rick, I was in vaccine research. And um, uh, I had had my own personal experiences uh, with my partner who is now my husband and felt like, you know, always with those personal experiences with psychedelics, always also in the back of my mind was that scientific mind and kind of that these are important tools but it never really occurred to me at that point like that they would that they would actually be in the medical system. So I heard Rick talking about this at um, a conference and, and also the idea of really doing this in a nonprofit way. And he said the words like, I wanna develop a nonprofit pharma company and I want you know to study MDMA for PTSD. And I looked at my um, uh, husband and I was like, I have to help him do this. It felt like this just moment for me of like real clarity of purpose. Um, and so that was when I, I reached out to, to Rick and um, around that time, I also read this book that I love called The Cosmic Serpent, Serpent. It's DNA and the Origins of Knowledge. Uh, it was written in 98, um, Jeremy Narby. And um, in it, there was this idea of molecular biology and kind of art um, and also um, access to information through psychedelics. And so it was like, there's multiple things giving me the idea that these, these, all these pieces for me that I loved of like the creativity of art and of um, that psychedelics could be an important tool. Um, and then having Rick talking about um, starting this work, uh, it just was like, uh, it was like everything came together into alignment for me. Fantastic. Um, so one of the things that really blew me away as coming at this not entirely a novice in terms of what I knew about psychedelics and about their potential, but pretty much as, as, a, as a, uh, a newbie. Uh, I, I think I was kind of lucky because I brought beginner's mind to it and read Michael's book and was literally blown away. And so I'm a big researcher and rabbit hole diver and I was flabbergasted when I saw that we had already had decades of research that was conducted completely ethically under all standard medical protocols, everything that was literally burned and thrown away or destroyed. And I just think to myself, okay, so this is happening in the United States of America, which I mean, is a constitutional republic with a bill of rights that are enumerated. I can only imagine what's happening elsewhere as well. The other thing, obviously, um, Rick, to your point, a lot of this research was done by Germans. 
and the Germans had just done one of uh, done the unspeakable, the unthinkable, and we had a, a historically at least I was born in 1960, so obviously I only heard about it, but we had this visceral reaction to anything put out by by Germans, even though, by the way, most of these researchers were German Jews. Uh, it was just all thrown out with the bathwater, which I think set back psychedelic research decades, set back dietary research decades. I mean, you can go down the list and, and just see all that was wasted. Um, are you right now trying to, I, I'm just, I wanna get a sense. Uh, are we over the hump where people hear psychedelic and immediately kind of stiffen up? I have noticed as I've had conversations about this with other people, um, that there is still kind of an axiomatic reflex that, um, uh, that you know, I, I love the, uh, the fictional character known as Jed McKenna, who writes an enlightenment series. And, and he says that, yeah, well, of course, the indoctrinators are fully indoctrinated themselves. So of course, they're going to uh, like, uh, like not like that. But are you finding? Is, is there, I was speaking to somebody who is um, a, uh, involved in, in psychedelic research and he was quite uh, bullish and, and he was quite um, uh, optimistic about the fact that perhaps we humans have begun our, um, our, our climb up what I call the leery tree of all of the various forms of imprinting. Well, am I totally crazy, Rick? So just to give you a sense of, so we've been going to these pockets where there's the most resistance, hmm. intentionally trying to educate people to try to make it so that there is no backlash. And one of the most important pockets of resistance, but also one of the greatest places of need is with the police, hmm. you know, because the police have highly traumatizing jobs. They have uh, large amounts of suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse, um, divorces, it's very difficult to be seeing the worst of humanity all the time, and also to having to um, pretend to be tough and not, you know, let it affect you and all. So a bunch of years ago, um, one of our, uh, a veteran who was in our study, one of the therapists, and, and we now have a senior retired DEA official that's acting as a consultant for us, Fantastic. because his son went to Iraq and got, came back with PTSD and found cannabis helpful. And so, uh, so we all went to the International Association of Chiefs of Police conference. And this is like 10,000 police chiefs and their lieutenants from all over the world. And we are gonna present about MDMA therapy for police officers with PTSD. And we get there and um, President Trump was president at the time. And, and he decided just a few days before this was his group, his people. And so uh, they scheduled his talk at exactly the same time as our talk. So <laughs> we, we get there and there's thousands and thousands of people standing in line. And we're like, oh my God, our talk must be really popular. <laughs> you know, but turns out, no, they're all to see Trump. And we go to our room of like 350 people and there's only 20 people there. But one of them sitting in the front row came up to us after the talk and said that he was a full-time police officer, but he was also a psychotherapist. And he mm -hmm. felt that the police needed more tools to help those that are suicidal, all these problems that they have, and, and could he uh, learn more about what we're doing? I said, we'll give you a scholarship to go through our training program. And he since has gone through our therapist training program. I've met his police uh, captain, and I've, I've met the chiefs of his department and the, the uh, head of the um, Massachusetts Police Chiefs Union and stuff, and explained what we're doing. And we did a good enough job that this uh, Sarko Gregarian's his name. We did a good, good enough job that his police chief let him volunteer to take MDMA as part of our therapist training program. So we have an FDA wow. approved protocol. That's all to say, to answer your question, there are pockets of resistance still. There are people that have this visceral reaction that's, uh, you know, I'm going to go crazy and I'm going to lose control and it's going to be terrible. But there's fewer and fewer of those pockets. And there's 
more and more people that are hopeful or interested because the suffering is so great. You know, we have more PTSD, more depression, more of this. Now, one of the other big pockets I would say is that we've treated over about 50 veterans with PTSD and have gotten tremendous results. Um, but we've not yet treated a single active duty soldier. Oh. So that's what we're wanting to do. And the same way we, in our studies, we treat people um, 18 or over. And, but the FDA has said to us, if we succeed and get approval for prescription use, we must use uh, a new study with adolescents with PTSD. So we have to study 12 to 17 year olds with PTSD. So, you know, that's going to get into some of the parents scared about, you know, protecting their kids, but there's good evidence that, um, you know, PTSD changes people's brains and they're suffering and nothing's helping and MDMA can be helpful. So all of this is to say is that I think our culture has grown tremendously in the last half century since the backlash, sir. And, um, and so I think that um, there's a, a real good chance that we will continue to reach out to those people that are scared and try to give them information to help them feel more open about this whole new area. So that was one of the things that I thought when I, when I started uh, donating to MAPS uh, that I thought was absolutely a stroke of brilliance on your behalf, which was treating uh, veterans. Because literally, I don't care about if you're a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter or a, just a crazy guy like me who just ha hates and is very anti-authoritarian. I think that there is one thing that virtually everyone that I know at least would agree with, which is we have to, we have to take care of our veterans. And so really well, brilliant. Yeah, well, yeah, that was so important the, to be bipartisan on yeah, this. Yeah, that was one of the things I learned at the Kennedy School, you know, is strategy. And, and, and how do you work with a, a population that's been miseducated, fearful, traumatized by stories of psychedelics? And you have to work with people that the culture appreciates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I, so I, I definitely commend you for that because, you know, <laughs> A lot of a lot of life comes down to framing things per, uh, yes. uh, appropriately, and and so yeah, and, yeah. and you know what what Amy said um, about our uh, but bipartisan. Uh, first off, we want to thank you for your support. That's been tremendous. Oh, it's it is truly my pleasure. Your recent support as well, but also you know Rebecca Mercer, who was the funder of Trump and Bannon. She gave us a million dollars for MD. Wow, Andy. that's fantastic but, to hear. Her only condition was it's only for veterans. Ah. And, and that's been that crossover. And I think there's an important part about changing people's minds when you're talking about has the culture um, gotten over this, right? Uh, gotten over this kind of reaction to hearing psychedelics is it's important to know somebody, right? This is how a lot of minds get changed is knowing somebody that's had the experience that you trust, right? It becomes like a personal interaction. So there's different there's different ways to change different minds. Like for the scientific community, community it's like data and we make sure we're publishing. Um, and then there's work in harm reduction. Um, and then there's work to educate the public and in doing, you know, doing shows like this that we're really speaking to a different audience. Um, that and then that opens their mind, I think, to going out and hearing the stories from people that have been healed or family members or somebody that's been healed. And that's really the way that I think this has been spreading more and more acceptance is gained is personal. Yeah. 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 And actually, there's sort of uh, support for what Amy just said in public surveys. So, you know, the, the drug policy reform movement is getting pretty sophisticated. We have marijuana legalization in multiple states. Um, you know, and so the surveys have been, why is somebody in favor of marijuana legalization? And you would think that the most important thing is if they smoke marijuana themselves, then they want it legal. But even more was if they know a medical marijuana patient, uh -huh. you know, they, they have some direct communication with somebody and then that pierces through all the propaganda and they say somebody at least found some benefit more than harms and why is that? And maybe this shouldn't all be illegal. So this idea that we hope to have um, a million MDMA sessions in this decade, train 25,000 therapists 
and have a million MDMA sessions and all those people around talk, talking to their families and their friends and, you know, about what happened to them, I, I think will be a massive change in the culture. I, I, I completely agree. And I think even though I myself have not had a close uh, relationship with somebody who's like had this dramatic change. I've, I've heard from enough people um, and uh, heard a lot. Uh, so I'm somewhat involved with uh, the Navy SEALs and, and oh, yeah. um, I, I think that they uh, do an amazing uh, thing for our country, but it also leaves them uh, probably very much in need of your services after the, yeah, yeah of know, course we you would. Know, we, we actually got a donation from the Navy SEAL Foundation. That's we got a $50,000 donation. It was their, they had to change, they had, the board of directors had to change their mission charter because wow. they were only providing services. They weren't supporting research. So they changed it in order to give us $50,000 to do MDMA PTSD research because so many Navy SEALs have spoken to them about their own use of psychedelics and how it's been important to them. But, but I do have a question, you know, if, if you don't mind, um, you know, how did you educate your daughter about psychedelics? So um, I uh, had kind of an unusual uh, thesis about how to raise children. And my thesis was that um, the goal that my wife and I had was uh, we wanted to raise good, successful adults hard stop. And if you think about that for a moment, you want to raise good adults, that precludes so many types of parenting that just naturally one would fall into. It precludes saying to them, uh, because I said so. It precludes saying to them, uh, my house, my rules. And it encourages discussion, um, but also, uh, if you asked any one of my kids, uh, I have a very big library and um, they will always joke when they're all together. Yeah, what did, what did dad do with you? And they all say in unison, he said, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I would rather say that my daughter and my son, both my daughters, I have a, a son and two daughters, and three grandchildren, two granddaughters and a grandson. Um, I, I would like to think, and I know um, that I didn't educate them, they educated themselves. And, um, you know, it was obviously through a friend of Kate who graduated from Yale that I, that I got involved in this um, and realized how many preconceived notions that I had. Yeah. And I think that um, you know, it, it led me to the work of Robert Anton Wilson. I don't know if you know his work, oh, yeah, for sure. uh, but so I've read everything he's written and um, what a magnificent mind 50, 60 years ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, then the, the, the tremendous irony of the fact that if one were to list uh, drugs and from, from most addicting to least addicting, it is my understanding that at the bottom of that list are the uh, medicines that we're talking about right now, our psychedelics. Yeah. At the top of that list are all the legal <laughs> drugs, <laughs> uh, you know, caffeine, nicotine, alcohol. And, and it seems to me perverse um, in, in, a, in a specially kind of twisted way that um, but I often joke, people will say uh, when they're commenting on, on Trump, uh, I, I always try to stay out really far away from uh, politics because I guess if I was in Britain, they'd call me a red Tory, um, which is, uh, you know, just don't be authoritarian around me. Don't tell me what to do. But, you know, sort of a, um, uh, I had one guy call me a, a libertarian anarchist when he was doing my <laughs> podcast. And I'm like, I don't think I'm either of those, but I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, but but the, uh, this idea that um, we, we, we were really <laughs> put kind of in a rotten place by Richard Nixon, essentially having a mental breakdown while he was the president of the United States. 
Yeah. And, and, and people will say, oh, Trump, that guy's crazy. And I'm like, not by a country mile is he the craziest man ever to occupy the White House. I think that that still is, uh, unless uh, there's some of the early guys I'm missing, I think that Richard Nixon maybe probably takes that prize. But the idea that we were able to vilify an entire class of yeah. medicines and or, or drugs, that we were able to send a Harvard professor to jail for God knows how many years for a joint and that we were able to do this because maybe there were three networks and only two newspapers that mattered. And if they all agreed, it was hard to see the other side. So I'm incredibly bullish on the internet uh, and the freedom it affords. Listen, I understand all the problems with it too, but the internet is not my term, but a, a friend of mine, the internet is an amplifier yeah. and it amplifies variants. So we spent uh, about a century after Napoleon tried to take over all the world, trying to dampen variants <laughs> with our various institutions. But then we introduced this, this, this incredible variance amplifier. But to me, one of the good things that's coming out of that is I, and I wanna, I wanna see if you agree with me, I don't think a vilification as conducted under Nixon would be possible these days. Am I, is, am, am I too uh, idealistic or optimistic about that? Well, I hate to say it, but I think you are. Because look at how many people believe that uh, the election was stolen from Trump. No. You know, the big lie works really well, particularly when it aligns with what people want to be believing or who they want to associate with. So you know, we could turn on a dime and have big lies about all sorts of different things. And I think there's a lot of people willing to believe it. Mm. And so I, I don't think we've evolved as much as we hope. Now, you, you talked multiple times about being anti-authoritarian. And I talked about how psychedelics were the antidote to genocide and things. If we feel our connection, it's, it's my same feeling about being, you know, anti-authoritarian. But recently, I've been thinking that even though MAPS is 36 years now, that you know, there's a psychedelic renaissance. I worry sometimes that it's happening a little bit too late. That mm -hmm. there, it's you know, the, the idea of mass mental health and making it available to people. That that we're entering a period where there's an enormous number of people willingly believing uh, delusionary ideas that they probably don't even really believe. It's just like a tribal signal, like I'm part of this group. I don't think they really believe a lot of it. They'll just say they do. Um, but I, I would say that. The key to our success with the psychedelic mainstreaming is continuing to have bipartisan support and continuing to go to where the pain is and trying to offer solutions. And, and people will gravitate towards that is our hope. So I think it feels a little uncomfortable to like, I, I love what you believe, Jim. And I, I feel like it, it almost feels a little bit dangerous to believe that because uh, then we're not paying enough attention to kind of the pieces that Rick is talking about and what is going on and what people do believe. And, um, you know, one of the, when you, I've heard you both talk kind of anti-authoritarian, and I think that psychedelics are helpful in that way and that they do open people's mind to think for themselves. Um, so besides the medical pieces and the medical parts that we're kind of working um, a lot on to bring healing, there's also personal growth pieces to the that, to this that I think is really important in consciousness expansion and 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 expanding your thinking yeah yeah I I I totally agree I think that um your points about people uh tribing up are very relevant and true Rick um I I think it's a uh just a colossal waste of time and energy. I talk to a lot of young people and um, I don't think of the last 20 young people and, I, and I'm defining young people as anyone uh, uh, younger than my youngest child. So my youngest child is turning 27. So anyone under that age, I, I consider a young, a young person. And honestly, of every 10 that I have discussions with, uh, it comes up pretty quickly that of the 10, nine are falsifying their preferences. 
uh, because they feel um, such overwhelming peer pressure to think or say a certain thing or act a certain way. And what's interesting is I try to be as, as universal in who I talk to as I can be because I know that I have a bunch of prejudices and then that I have a bunch of things that are wrong and I try to always eliminate every, uh, an error a day, right? <laughs> and I, if I can do that, I'm, I'm making some progress. Um, and this is both sides of the spectrum. Um, it's it's not it's not just very uh, very uh, progressive people. It's not conservative people. They're all saying the same thing, and and so I think that's another um, that's another uh, good point for the idea of um, psychedelics uh, as opening not only your awareness of and connection with other human beings, maybe other sentient beings, period. Uh, but it's also an amazing, at least it looks like an amazing tool for growth um, in a variety of non-prescribed areas, right? So I totally get and think, by the way, that you are doing it exactly the right way. Um, and I'm, I'm not Pollyannish here. I mean, Leary gave testimony to Congress in which he was very explicit about that this should be used under medical supervision. And that seems to have been lost. So I, I get your your hesitation and your feeling uh, of- Yeah, I would say for Leary though, that, that he was saying that um, treatment of people with clinical indications should be done under medical supervision, but he was also encouraging people to do it on the Selves, you know, oh, without. sure. Yeah. No, he, he brought a lot of that out himself. I, I yeah. will grant you. I, yeah. I grant that to you. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by these, these pockets of history. I, 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 I like to write sci uh, or fictional treatments too. I haven't done it as much recently, but one that I wrote uh, back when I was in my 20s was that it was a science fiction y type of thing. And, and it was that these very, very advanced aliens were opening a window on earth to see if we were ready, right? To see if, if, they, if we were ready for their help um, to, to evolve. Um, and uh, I think the, the name of it was uh, Ascension or something along those lines. And, and I found, I've been keeping journals since I was 18 years old and young me was pretty smart. Uh, I got dumber over time as opposed to the other way around. But, um, and then these windows would snap shut. And so, but then I started thinking about it, like not as fiction, but as I, I thought to myself, you know, I wonder if I went and looked at the cultural icons of the late sixties, early seventies, would, would it, would they all be pointing to psychedelics and gosh darn, with the help of YouTube and with a lot of uh, the library associations that I belong to, the answer seems to be yes. So it seems to me that you're absolutely right. Leary also was being very loud about being in favor of psychedelics, but um, it, it, is, there, is there anything that really worries you about not, not a dedicated foe who is just opposed to psychedelics because that's maybe they're puritanical or whatever. Is, is there anyone out there who would be seen as an honest broker? Um, and, and they, is, what I guess I'm asking is, is there any legitimate ammunition that people might use to try to shut down what I think is miraculous research? Um, no, there's not. <laughs> Um, now, there are legitimate fears and concerns which we address in our studies. So, you know, uh, so for example, um, it's not the psychedelic, it's the therapy. The psychedelic helps the therapy be more effective. Right. But just taking a psychedelic, you could end up worse off, not better. It's not like the magic is in the pill. The magic is in the relationship, in the context, in the relationship with the therapists, in the preparation. And as I talked earlier before, a lot of it in the integration that I didn't appreciate in my early years. 
Yeah. So the concerns that people could have are that, you know, there's not enough therapeutic support. We enroll people who, in our studies who previously attempted suicide. Most uh, or many of the PTSD studies exclude people who previously attempted suicide on the theory that they're um, too vulnerable and that if somebody commits suicide during your study, it's going to be a bad thing. Right. But we feel that we have to work with the hardest cases. So somebody could say to us, you know, you're not having enough of the therapeutic support, but, you know, nobody who's ever, so far at least, um, been in our study who's gotten MDMA has gone on and killed themselves or even tried to kill themselves. It gives them hope. So, so there are various concerns, you know, for many years, people were saying MDMA causes neurotoxicity and brain damage. And, you know, now it's a legitimate concern if it were true, turns out it's not true. And we have, you know, that, that was exaggerated to justify the criminalization. People can say, um, you know, you, you don't um, do enough screening, you know, to figure out who's going to respond, who's not going to respond. So, you know, MDMA increases your heart, uh, pre blood pressure and heart rate a little bit, you know, so you, so you have to do certain kind of screenings. But, but I don't think there's any sort of good faith, honest uh, reasons that people would give to shut the research down. No, I think most of that would be fear-based, right? And that if, uh, and those, if, if there's a fear about something, it's something we can find out the answer to. Yeah, um, I, I referred to him earlier, um, uh, McKinnon, who is a, a, a pseudonym, uh, and he's in the very highly misnamed spiritual awakening category. Um, and um, one of his quotes is, we are a fear-based creatures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more I studied and the more I read, the more obvious that became to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll look around at what's happened uh, yeah. recently over the last two years. Um, hey, it's so much reactivity, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and this othering of people, mm -hmm. I just find abhorrent and and you know, uh, it's 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 built unfortunately into our human OS. And one way, and why when, when I'm so interested in psychedelics as as a um, assist, if you will, to yes. move be move beyond uh, where our human operating system is right now, it's time for an upgrade. I think, frankly, um, and I'm speaking just for myself here, uh, but I think that that is true for every everybody. But I did have a specific question uh, for, for you, Rick, and, and Amy, if you want to also offer an opinion. You referred several times to MDMA, but am I, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but MDMA is a euphoric. It's not a psychedelic, right? Well, well, I wouldn't, people have tried, well, back in the 80s when MDMA was, um, you know, being used as a therapy drug, but it also become ecstasy. Sure. And a club, it was a club drug. Basically, yeah, it was a club drug. Um, you know, it was a therapy drug before it was a club drug. Right. But when the DEA first moved in 84 to try to criminalize it, a bunch of people tried to say, oh, let's say it's a different category of thing. They didn't use the word euphoria, but it was more like an empathogen, you know, to promote empathy or intactogen yep. you touch mm -hmm. with it. And there's a whole lot of effort. And it does work differently than the classic psychedelics. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of discussions, you know, what's proper psychedelic? What does the word really mean? The word was developed in the late 50s by Humphrey Osmond and Aldous Huxley, and it means mind manifesting or to, right. to reveal the mind. And so we use it in a very broad way that um, hyperventilation, um, this holotropic breath work that I've learned from Stan Groff is one of the therapeutic approaches that's psychedelic because it changes you enough so that you have this flow from the unconscious to, the, to awareness. Meditation, you could say, be psychedelic. Marijuana, I think, is more psychedelic, closer to the classic psychedelics than MDMA is. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I think so people I'm, confuse the word hallucinogen, like a classic hallucinogen, potentially with psychedelic, and psychedelic meaning just it produces changes in your perception, mood, um, cognitive process. And I loved the, I love like the, the, I think of it as mind manifesting, right? Like what Rick was saying. So uh, let's talk about that for a minute then, um, because 
Um, I've had uh, conversations with people who are very intelligent, actually with um, people who are trained PhDs in medical fields, et cetera. And like they, they get into these things that frankly, um, uh, as someone who's read a lot about it, I, I think I can answer, but I don't have the authority to kind of like say, well, this is the way it is, uh, even though I've read every study. Um, but like they try to they try to make this huge distinction between man-made psychedelics, as in LSD, and natural psychedelics, as in psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Enlighten this poor soul here. I, I, Rick, you love this question. I'm going to let you go for this. <laughs> and, um, you know, well, let's just start with mushrooms, right? There are poisonous mushrooms and there are psychedelic mushrooms and there's edible mushrooms and there's medicinal mushrooms. And so this romantic idea that if it's from nature, it's good. If it's from the lab, from people, it's bad. Yeah. You know, I think that that's going to be really, really helpful for marketing. You know, <laughs> of course a, it is. <laughs> from a scientific point of view, um, there's no difference between a synthetic version of psilocybin or, you know, psilocybin that's extracted from the mushroom, you know, and in fact, one of the best examples, and people have had some questions about this, but um, Albert Hoffman was um, the one that was successful in synthesizing um, psilocybin and figuring out that psilocybin was the active ingredient in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. the, the reason that he was so successful, where other people had failed before that, is that he was willing to take, he would fractionate the substances and then he would take them and whichever one was active, he'd say, let's look, keep more in that direction. Right. But in the dry season, they went back to Maria Sabina, which was the uh, Mazatec Indian that had given the mushroom to Gordon Wasson and sort of introduced psychedelic mushrooms to the West. Again, that knowledge had been lost by the dominant culture. And in a dry season, Albert and Gordon Wasson and others, they went back to Maria Sabina with the synthetic psilocybin. And they had her, they did a ceremony. And she is reported to have said, the spirit of the mushroom is in the pill. Yeah. So well, I really uh, don't think much about this. Oh, if it's from nature, it's good. If it's from the lab, it's bad. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I just find, uh, and, and listen, uh, I, I, I believe pretty much that almost everything started as a marketing campaign, uh, you know, uh, so kind of, for example, I had uh, Brian uh, Mua, uh, Mua Retsku, uh yeah, on, on the show, yeah. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's fantastic, and yeah. like what I found interesting was sort of threefold. Number one, of course, of course. If I was going to start a religion, that's exactly <laughs> what I would do. Come and come and you'll talk to the gods, and they and you do. Um, but uh, it it led me down the sort of the path of well, gosh, like it probably all does start as a marketing campaign of some type. Um, and and I loved this idea. His his book, I'm sure you've both read it. Uh, reads like a reads like a fictional thriller. It's just so beautifully written, and he's so well spoken on on the subject. Um, and and I wonder, um, I I was trying, and that's what led me to the question because I become impatient with people who like to me. Uh, this is the chemical composition. It doesn't matter if we make it in a lab or if we pick it with our own hands outside, it's gonna have the same chemical composition, but maybe maybe there is something to a little bit of mystique. And like one of the big things with people in my industry when they, when they reach a certain place is, is to do the great ceremony of flying down to Peru and having the uh, ceremonies with the shamans down there um, uh, I, I, I personally would rather kind of stay where, you know, if I needed medical assistance, I could get it stacked, <laughs> but I tend to be very practical about those kinds of things. Um, do, do you think that there's too many, 
are there too many stories that are are being told around psychedelics um or or too few it sounds like a very weird question to ask but i'm asking about it in in this thought about like when you frame something a certain way for example nobody bought death insurance and some bright person came along and said that's not death insurance that's life insurance trillion dollar industry <laughs> yeah is there is there anything like that that could happen here where people would just go ah oh, Well, I, I, I don't know. I think the, um, you know, the talk about the outcomes is what motivates people. Yeah. You know, um, whether we can, you know, one thing I try to do, like we just described it a little bit before about what is psychedelic. Well, I like to say dreams are psychedelic. Right. Hyperventilation. So then I try to normalize psychedelic. Like it's stuff mm -hmm. that you all know already. Right. You know, we go to a psychedelic state at night, every night when we're dreaming. <laughs> exactly. You know. I think there's also a danger in um, in um, almost like the over positivity of something because we, we've actually had a few people enter our studies um, and think they're getting a magic cure, right? And um, then be frustrated at the amount of work that it is, right? The pill is not the cure. There, there's this inner healing intelligence that is getting tapped into by taking that and then being in the right set and setting and with people that are trained to support that process and it's still an incredible amount of work to go in and touch that trauma for the people that are doing it. And there's when there's too many stories told that um, just make it sound so easy, then there's not a realistic expectation. Um, and I think there's also, you know, it people might uh, be more inclined to enter risky situa situations uh, if they're not really hearing the whole story. So I think it's not a matter of too many of this kind of story or too many of the right. We just need the right kind of stories that are based in reality to be told. <laughs> and, I, I, yeah, I think that's, that is absolutely the right answer. Um, yeah. I, I remember Bob Persig, who wrote Zen and the Art of Motorcycle oh, wow. Maintenance, uh, said uh, something, and I'm going to get this wrong, but along the lines of, if you put your faith in the stone, that's where the faith will remain. And what he was trying to get at was what you just said, I think. Yeah, Maybe. these are very empowering for the person. I think that's one of the things that's beautiful about this therapy is it's like this, this MDMA assisted therapy and really the person is empowered. We, it, it, within the treatment, um, it is, um, you know, we really try to put the person in touch with their inner wisdom of how this trauma can be healed. And it's very empowering. Nobody's doing it to you. You are healing yourself and nobody can then ever take that away from you. When you're done with this treatment, a doctor didn't do it to you, right? You were an active participant and you were guiding the path to your healing and somebody was um, believing in you enough and supporting you enough to follow you on that path. I think that's, uh, that is a brilliant framing here because I agree with you. I'm, I don't know, but have you, are you familiar with the medical doctor, John Sarno? Um, he, wow. he, so, so he, he recently died. He was a medical doctor who practiced here at the uh, NYU Rehabilitative Medicine. Um, and he started what I kind of think is a revolution in mind-body studies. Um, and um, he was very dissatisfied with the results that he was getting uh, in helping people with pain. Um, so he did a very deep dive into it. He himself had su uh, suffered from migraines and he's got several books that um, literally, um, after you read them enough times, you essentially heal yourself. And a lot of medical doctors ridiculed him and wouldn't take him seriously. And um, I had mentioned him several times on my podcast as I, I'm a big believer. I was cured of a particular physical problem using the Sarno. But I like this idea of empowering the individual to understand that they are fixing themselves. Amy, at your point was, is, in my opinion, absolutely critical to get across that this isn't a pill that you can buy 
and and all of a sudden you're going to get better. <laughs> it's a, it's not a surgery. It's it's not something being done to you. That I think is a wonderful way to frame this because your observation also that can't be taken from you. Yeah. And and so I think that that is a brilliant um, uh, well, way of explaining. Yeah, and not only that it can't be taken uh, from you, but that life is going to continue to be challenging. Yeah. And yes. We want people to go forward with new tools. So this is where we're different from traditional pharma, where they want to you know treat the symptoms and have you take a daily drug for the rest of your life. Right. <laughs> Well, it's a good business, very good business model, but yeah, yeah we have a bad business model. <laughs> that's, that's what I love about you. <laughs> uh, the, the other part too is that a key to our scaling is going to be insurance coverage. Yeah. And this is more expensive initially than giving somebody a pill because it's associated with so much psychotherapy. So the key to insurance company is going to be the durability of results. You know, if it lasts for a long time, then insurance can say, yeah, we'll pay for it. If it fades after six months and they got to do this expensive thing every six months, they won't do it. So this idea of helping people to heal themselves, to give them the tools to continue to make progress, even without more MDMA sessions, contributes to the durability and it will contribute then to the scalability because it'll help us get insurance coverage. Yeah. And that's what we saw. We did long-term follow-up. So I think there's this, there's, I like to use the word resilience. It's like re, re, reinstalling people's resilience and, and tools and kind of faith in themselves and uh, empathy for themselves. Um, and we saw in our long-term follow-ups that um, people a lot of times continued to get better. One year after their last treatment, their, the way that we measure their trauma, the, um, that it had continued to improve when we administered that same test a year and more than a year later. Now, some people relapsed, right? This is to be expected. People had additional traumas that happened and they and, and we got permission to treat them again one more time. And um, again, we saw an improvement. Um, but one thing we, we see from that is that if people are still in the traumatic situation, of course, they're gonna continue to get re-traumatized and you can only have you know, so much accumulation of that before you need help again, like where, you know, you can help yourself, but then at some point it, it, it can be overwhelming. Uh, but if you're taking people out of the traumatic situation for the most part, and they're accumulating normal traumas that we go through as humans, they seem to have a better um, ability to deal with that. And then it's like a positive feedback loop, right? They're changing their lives in positive ways, better relationships, better work. Um, and all of this is like, um, conspiring in a good way for them to continue to improve. Mm -hmm. um, I read a book, I can't recall the author's name now, but uh, the title was The Body Keeps the Score. Yes, Bessel uh, van der Kolk. He's uh, one of our okay. therapists on our phase oh, three is he? study. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. It was wonderful. RPI, he's, one, a, he's a he's an investigator. Well, we yeah. have a good, a good comment about Bessel. So, um, <laughs> you know, he came to us to work with us on phase three uh -oh. and we had previously done phase two. And so, you know, his book, The Body Keeps Score, is a lot about um, early childhood trauma and um, attachments, problems with attachments and all. And so his advice to us as he just was coming in to work with us on phase three was to not enroll people with complex PTSD from childhood, that they have poor attachment and that they'll be the hardest people to treat. And therefore, if we want to get good results and we want to get FDA approval, we should leave them out of the study. And so we knew from um, phase two that it worked in complex PTSD. Plus, we never do anything the easy way. <laughs> well, yeah. again, another thing I love about you. I, I uh, but so continue, we ended please. Up, we ended up um, enrolling. Uh, Bessel is the principal investigator of the Boston site. And what we have shown in our first phase three study is actually there's a group called the dissociative subtype, which is it's a strategy when you get traumatized is to pretend you're not there, you know, to right. dissociate from it. Yep. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, because it's so painful, it's hard to get back because every time you come close, the pain is overwhelming. You run away again. That's where you get drug addiction and stuff. So what we showed though, is that people on the dissociative subtype on average did better than those in our study that weren't on the dissociative. And a subtype. very small number. <laughs> a very small number, but, but it really impressed Bessel. 
And now he's very much uh, an advocate for MDMA as a, a key treatment for post-traumatic stress. That and 30% of the people in the group had childhood trauma, exactly the group he was worried about. And they did very well. Mm, they did yeah. as well or better than, so it's, you know, the time, uh, the time, it's better to hit, treat the trauma close in time, right? Be partly because there's changes to your brain, changes to your coping, all kinds of things that happen the longer that it goes on. But, um, but you know, there's, it's just the, this idea that maybe you can't treat the trauma of too much time has gone by is not, has not been what we've found in our studies. And the first study we did, the average duration that people had had PTSD was 18 years oh, my prior God. to the treatment. So uh, it's, it's, and most of them have had childhood trauma. Our vets, one of the requirements to enter the study for the vet studies was that it was a war related trauma. Now, what it turned out was they had that, but like 99% of them also had a childhood trauma that came out in the therapy. And so, and, and they all did very well in the study. You know, there's that, that study was published um, and we did, had vets, firefighters and police officers, like first responders in that study. And, you know, I think there's also something to that, that people that experience PTSD later in their life, um, it does seem like there's a large connection to earlier trauma that kind of predisposes them to a PTSD that doesn't naturally recover. There's a lot of, a lot of people go through terrible traumas um, and don't end up with, uh, with treatment resistant or long-term PTSD. There's a, in six months, there's a natural recovery rate. Um, so what's the difference between the people that recover from it and that don't there, there could be this connection to also early hood, early childhood trauma that predisposes you. Yeah. Now, another thing is that, that you know, because of We're the, not even the, letting you get a, a word in edgewise, Jeff, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, please. <laughs> uh, that, um, you know, because of uh, HIPAA privacy laws, you know, we don't get to know who the people are in the study unless they right. come forward. So sure. just a few days ago, there was a patient that wanted to sort of say thanks and talk to me. So we, we had the Zoom call. The important point is he had PTSD for over 50 years from Vietnam, and he was still able to get better. <laughs> and it took him a while. He said even after the third session, he had a lot more growth, this idea that he could keep healing himself afterwards. But it was that you could be stuck for 50 years and still get better. That's the beautiful thing about it. So that is just so remarkable to me um, that, uh, you know, if, I, if you were gonna have me consult you on framing things, that would be high on the list because um, it, it is so at odds with what your average person, at, especially in the United States, has come to expect from this idea of healthcare which I think uh, we, that is a whole different subject, but needs a lot of help itself. Um, but this idea that even if it's something 50 years um, present with you, that there is a cure, that is remarkable. And that is, to me, one of the reasons why I am so uh, interested and excited by this type of research, because Another thing that I have thought a lot about doing at some point um, is would be to kind of fund a study uh, that puts together the mind-body experiences that Sarno wrote about, uh, throw, throws in, um, I had a, as a guest, someone who was using um, sound therapy and getting very, very good results uh, with it. Um, and then frankly, uh, adding in things such as virtual reality, psychedelics, and hypnotism. I, I have this idea, but I, I state kind of everything as a thesis because most of them have a null, null set as the answer. <laughs> That's just kind of life. Um, but so I, I do think that there, that that would be a very interesting thing that I would be almost willing to get other folks to contribute and, and fund a study like that is a multidiscipline, Mary. Um, Don't jump you, Rick. <laughs> whenever we hear people offering funding, you know, our ears perk up. And we think, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I will tell you um, one thing. So there's about this. Um, 
There's a woman named Edna Foa who has developed prolonged exposure. It's one of the main therapies used by the VA and others for PTSD. The idea of prolonged exposure means that you talk about your trauma over and over and over, and eventually it doesn't trigger you the same way. But it's very triggering for a lot of people, and a lot of people <laughs> drop out about it. It's 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 you know it's of uh, it's very difficult for people. And so, you know, we were talking to her about uh, MDMA therapy, and this was at a conference in 2009 in Jerusalem, and. She said, um, forget about this MDMA. It's like dynamite in the brain. It's a terrible thing. Just give it up. Go and use virtual reality. And there was a fellow named Skip Rizzo who was um, funded by the Department of Defense, actually, to develop- DARPA. Uh, yeah, DARPA, right? Yeah, I think I read about that. things it. for um, soldiers for PTSD. So we've got all these VR scripts of them you know, going by- um, you know, roads with snipers or um, improvised explosive devices or stuff like that. Um, so he's from the University of Southern California. So Edna said, go talk to Skip about VR, you know, get rid of this MDMA stuff. So I go over to Skip and I'm saying, you know, Edna, she's all, you know, crazy about MDMA. It's terrible. She says, I should talk to you about VR. And he just starts laughing. And he says, if you have MDMA, you don't need VR. <laughs> So right. I, 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 Fair I, enough. I, but we still want you to fund a study. <laughs> <laughs> mm, um, you know, mm, but maybe yeah. it's, you know, VR in prep or integration or stuff, but the MDMA sessions, and this is this idea of people being their own healing. So, mm -hmm. so actually, I'll give you another story about VR that, that's got me concerned. There, there was um, a soldier in Israel that was... Um, it was a, a bunch of his um, associates had been um, killed in their sleeping bags by an infiltrator and he discovered their bodies blown to bits. And this was the source of his PTSD. And he's, you know, it, it was 10 years before, now he would be hiding under his uh, kitchen table, his kids would find him at different sounds and things. It was a terrible thing. So he comes into therapy and it's all about this thing that happened in the war. and. At one point, what he was saying was that um, it was okay, it would be okay, not okay, but it would be better if they died in combat. But they died in their sleeping bags when they were helpless. That's what makes it so difficult. That's why it's such a problem for me. And he went on to talk about their helplessness. And then he pivoted and he said, when I was a child, my father used to beat me up and I was helpless. Mm. And the whole rest of his session was about that. Yeah. So, so my concern about VR is people pivot in these ways. There's these like archaeology of trauma. And you go down layers and layers and layers. But if you've got this VR script, that's just about the war related thing. Right. But then his internal healing, this inner healing goes, hey, my ch father, my childhood, that's where this helpless feeling really was rooted. Sure. I don't know that you, you, I think you'd be on the wrong track with the VR. It wouldn't let you, you know, how do you know when to pivot like that? Only the person's inner sense knows when to pivot. Right. That's an interesting point. And, you know, I was just reading last night an interesting thesis that Martin Luther, um, the uh, emancipator of uh, repressed Catholics all over Europe, uh, was actually um, driven, at least through this fellow's hypotheses, uh, through the vicious beatings that his father and mother gave wow. him every morning. And uh, I haven't gotten to the end yet, so I, I, I can't give you the spoiler, uh, but I, it did get me thinking about that and um, how lucky and fortunate and privileged I have been that that didn't happen in my life. Um, and uh, it, it makes me want even more to, to help people where it has, because very few things leave visible marks, right? The body keeps the score, but there isn't some huge scar that yeah. you can point to and say, and by the way, that's part of Sarno's, um, uh, his uh, thesis is, that many times people will repress um, feelings um, and the primary ones are rage and fear. 
uh, because they feel that it is not socially acceptable to be talking about these things that are very human in nature. So they get repressed and they come out in the form of symptoms. Um, and so I could, I, I could talk about this endlessly. I find it ever so fascinating, but I'm looking at the clock and well, I know- well, Let I, me just on, on something about the mind-body connection, which is, yeah. that, um, you know, we focused on PTSD. You know, that's, that's something that happens to you. But there are other things like uh, diseases like uh, fibromyalgia or irritable bowel syndrome that have a, a strong psychological component, but there's a physical element too. So that I'd say was going to be the second wave of psychedelic psychotherapy. Eating really disorders, sad. eating disorders also. Just, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating to hear yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just oh. last night I was talking um, Andy Wild, you know, who um, sure talks about how under the influence of LSD he was able to get over an allergy to cats that he had. It, listen, it's remarkable. Um, you even have people like Darren Brown, who, who wrote the book Happy, Why More or Less Everything is Okay. I can't remember the exact title, but he's an illusionist. And, and he's very popular in the UK. And he did one program that I particularly enjoyed, uh, showing the power of the human mind. Uh, and uh, it was about the power of placebos. Yes. Um, and, and what is very interesting to me is that that too, ultimately, even when the, the person is told, oh, by the way, that this was a placebo, they have internalized the new way of doing or being. Essentially, I think the way he goes about describing it is they've given themselves permission to you know, fill in the blank. And what, what um, jogged that in my mind was you talking about the, um, curing themselves from an allergy, uh, yeah. goodness. Yeah. goodness. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, I personally think that, um, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of the book, The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. And uh, I think we're sort of at the beginning of infinity here. And I'm just frankly kind of happy to be around to see all of this going on because I, I think, yes, of course there are problems. There will always be problems. But I, I find it wonderful that there are people like you working on solutions, uh, not only to the obvious things like PTSD, but um, eating disorders. That's a huge problem yeah. area. Um, yeah. Allergies, all of those things. Remarkable, remarkable stuff. Well, I always end every podcast uh, with kind of a, a fun question. And so I'm going to ask you both. You both get a chance. We are going to wave a wand. And we are going to make you the emperor, Rick, or the empress, Amy, of the world. But with rules, you can't kill anyone. Okay. You can't lock anyone up. But you can incept them. If you're familiar with the movie Inception. Yeah. Um, so you can incept them so that when they go to sleep that evening into a psychedelic state, they'll wake <laughs> up the next morning and they'll think, wow, I just had the greatest idea. What two ideas are you going to incept with them? Rick, I'll start with you and then Amy. Oh, okay. Before I get that, since we've talked a lot about books, I just want to say one thing. You, you, uh, Amy probably knew I was going to do this, but uh, you talked about the Zen and the Outer Motorcycle Maintenance. Yeah. So that's one of the most important books in my life. It was Same very with me. inspirational. And, um, and I read it shortly before um, I turned 21. And um, I was looking for a dog and there was a friend of mine that she saw an ad in the paper for a wolf um, for the Humane Society uh, was putting it up. They, they shut down a wild animal breeding operation and they had uh, the female wolf was pregnant. They had a litter of eight wolf cubs and the zoos were full and the sanctuaries were full. And so I decided uh, to adopt one of these wolves. Um, and I, li you know, we lived together for two years before a, a spot in a wolf sanctuary opened up for him. But um, uh, his name was Phaedrus. And that's the name from <laughs> Alter Ego. Zen yes, and, and of course, one of Plato's uh, famous dialogues as well. Yeah, and it's it, and the dialogue is in a guy from the countryside coming, and so it's in a sense about the taming power of love. Yes, 
So yeah. that's what was oh, this. Oh, that's marvelous. That's a yeah, marvelous and, story. And these wolves were born, uh, wolves are born with their eyes closed. And so the Humane Society, it takes them a couple days for their eyes to open. So the Humane Society uh, took them away from their mother and was bottle feeding them. So they bonded on people when they opened their eyes. So it was incredible. So I just wanted to mention that because it's- that was, That's wonderful. I mean, wonderful. you must be a big fan of uh, Conrad Lorenzen as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance at least every other year and have since I was 18. Yeah. So it had a huge impact on me as well. But now yeah. we're going to incept some now people, Rick. Yes. <laughs> okay. so, um, so MAPS is, um, over the 36 years, we've raised $130 million in donations and grants. So, you know, and now there's these roughly 400 for-profit psychedelic companies. Um, and also it's getting harder for us to raise uh, philanthropy so that's another reason to thank you because a lot of people are thinking why why should i give it away let me just invest in some psychedelic company right um so what i would like people to um go to bed thinking about and have this dream and wake up and to realize that in healthcare, the profit motive has warped healthcare in america beyond any kind of sensible situation and so i'd like them to think about um waking up and, and giving a few dollars to maps as a donation <laughs> from several hundred million people, you know, it just can be a few bucks. Well, um, if you if you did it just in this country, you'd be getting uh, about three hundred thirty million dollars the next day. So that's a good inception. That's a, yeah, you know, when ever we, the fundraiser and visionary. Uh, <laughs> I love yeah, it. I love it. Because <laughs> when we first started Maps, I had this idea: MDMA is a party drug, and people are it's now criminalized. So all these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are, you know, doing ecstasy, we'll get them to give us 10 bucks and that, then we'll do the research and make it legal. And, and it took me a while to realize that they would rather buy more ecstasy with their 10 bucks than give it to us. Um, so the other thing that I would like to uh, incept in people is that um, now I, I've had a few times in my life, I've had dreams where I was tripping in my dream on LSD. Mm. It's just, this is amazing, you know, because I was actually like tripping in my dreams um, without the drug even, but it was like that. So I would like people to wake up and to realize that the personal growth that they're looking for will come from direct personal experience. And that after they send money to maps, they should go off and try to have a psychedelic experience under supervision with friends or in a therapy setting or something like that. And that, um, and that one of the highest and best uses of MDMA is couples therapy. So if they've got somebody they're in love with, you know, do it with them. Or that, so I'd like them to wake up and then MAPS is fully funded and we've got all these happy people in the world. What, what, a, great, uh, what a great way to incept people. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy, what have, what have you got? How am I going to top this one? I don't know. I don't, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I think I would plant a seed of like true curiosity and openness in people to learn um, about other cultures, other people's cultures, so that the next morning they would wake up with a true desire to understand and engage um, learning about another culture. Um, and my other thought was, um, that this open a little along the lines of what Rick was saying is that there's this, that, that there would be a, a plant a seed of openness to that. There is a potential for healing for all and what that could do in the world. Um, and that it comes through like personal transformation and growth and personal inner internal healing first. Mm. And that, that, that inner work first is what's going to lead to this hopeful place. So wonderful, uh, both of you, with uh, with those inceptions. It, it's great. Well, listen, <laughs> you guys are doing amazing work. I am so impressed by uh, both of you and by Maps. Uh, keep up the great work, and uh, I will continue to support you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you so much. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Sharon.